Hey, good morning. So I'm going to share something with you, and I hope it doesn't come back to bite me one day. I don't thank you for the chuckle. I'm nervous too. One of the things I'm very afraid of is being out in like the ocean by myself like adrift, right? Like clinging to like a piece of lumber or something. Like your ship sinks and you're just out there, your boat sinks and you're out there, just kind of drifting along. Um, I know that's not like a common thing that happens to people, particularly in a landlocked place like Dallas. I think White Rock Lake's the really the only thing I have to be afraid of at this juncture. Um, but we get some rain showers here that are pretty, pretty intense. Uh, but yeah, you just kind of out there in a drift. And what I think is funny is you'll see some movies where, uh, where uh, the, the guy will like wash up on shore and he'll like wake up. And he's like, where am I? And he's like on a desert island by himself. I don't know that that has ever happened where somebody slept through the washing up on shore moment. Um, I'd be pretty awake for that. I know they're unconscious, I'm just saying. But I think many of us in our lives are actually adrift and unconscious. We're unaware of the fact that spiritually, maybe in a whole lot of ways other than spiritually, we're actually just adrift. We're just riding the waves. We're, we're coasting. Maybe that's another way you want to look at it. We're coasting through life. And we don't sense a great deal of purpose. Maybe, and, and I'm, I'm in middle age now, and so you kind of realize that like your life is what the sum of your decisions right now, and like you're kind of on a track. Like I really can't just quit um, being, I guess I could, but like it's not like I could go back and be a doctor now. It's kind of that, that door's closed. I don't know that that door was ever really open uh, for me. But you're kind of just, just, maybe you feel like you're on a train track that's headed like in one particular direction, or you're adrift. And, and you're just out there kind of riding the waves. I think a lot of us can feel a sense of purposelessness, a sense of loss, maybe even a sense of um, discontent with the, the, the sea we find ourselves in, perhaps. And so what I want us to talk about today is I want us to talk about the fact that, that we have a God uh, who can guide us. And, and we're in the book of Proverbs, as TJ mentioned, and this is our second week studying it. We're going to look at this idea of guidance and the fact that God wants to guide us through our lives to a safe harbor, to a safe place, resting with him. And so what I want us to do, as TJ mentioned, I want us to think, I want you to actually have a decision. And we're going to kind of walk through some exercises, walk through some praying about this decision. I want you to think about a decision that you're facing, and we're going to see if we can apply some of these ideas to it. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 16 for most of our time, and I want us to see three practices that kind of help us navigate the decision-making process. So first, let's talk about a practice to avoid, and that is we can't look inside ourselves. We can't look inside ourselves. Verse 1 of chapter 16, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. So one of the things that Proverbs tries to do really well is to set your life on a course so that you can arrive where God wants you to be. You can live a wise life. And one of the things that's mentioned here in these first three verses is there's a little bit of tension that's created between the first line in each verse and the second line in each verse. Because the first line is kind of what a human being does. This is what I'm going to do to plan my life. This is what I'm going to do to chart the course. And the second line is kind of what God does. It's kind of his place in all of it. It's what he does. And this tension that we feel is one of the major reasons why I think seeking guidance from God is difficult. So let's tease out some of these tensions that we feel, and then we'll try and tie it up there at the end. So the first tension is expectation versus certainty. Expectation versus certainty. Verse 1, again, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So the heart is the seat of your identity in the ancient world. It was the core of your being, right? And from there, we tend to make plans, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because we don't make plans kind of non-committally. And what I mean by that is when we make plans, we get real attached to our plans, right? Like if it's in my calendar, it must happen. 
Now, we do it with big things, like I plan on dating somebody, I plan on getting married, having 2.5 children, having a house, and da-da-da-da-da, and then, you know, that's my plan. Or I plan on pursuing this career, getting this degree, having a fulfilling career, and then retiring early enough to where I can still enjoy some of the life that I have left. That's my plan. And when somebody throws a wrench in those plans, we're not like, oh, yeah, no big deal. It's fine. I, I, I'm not going to get to do that thing that I wanted to do. I can't do math, so I can't do that thing I wanted to do. Or, you know what? I'm in my 40s, still not married. It's fine. It's okay. No big deal. No, you know what? We even do it in small things. Some of you are thinking about right now what you're going to eat after I finish up. And some of you are full of righteousness and hope that you have chosen Mexican. And God bless you. But some of you are degenerates and are thinking about Mediterranean food. And you all are in the same household. One of you is going to be disappointed. Or you're going to do that thing where like one of you goes to like a shopping center and you get one thing and you go to the other and you meet in the middle. That's great. That's compromising. Take advantage of that. But we have expectations. But look what's said in the second verse, or in the second part of the verse. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The word of the Lord knows no such thing as expectation. Now, what I mean by that is when the word of God comes forth, when God speaks, something happens. How does he create? He speaks. Let there be light. How does he heal? He speaks. Think about when Jesus heals somebody, he usually speaks. When he forgives somebody, he usually speaks. When he calms the storm, what does he do? Does he like clap his hands? No, he speaks. The word of God is the single most effective power in all of existence. And it is a certain power. God doesn't operate with expectation. God operates with certainty, which is very different from the way we operate, right? Now, when I have expectations, I expect to finish my sermon today. I know, I'm sorry, but I do expect to finish. Now, I can say that because I'm so close to actually finishing it. I expect to take my next breath because I'm so close to taking it. Now, could there be a fire alarm that makes us leave early and, and, and I don't finish? Sure, it's not likely. I gave somebody an idea just then. They're like, wait a minute. It's not a bad idea. I get that Mexican sooner. But if I want to preach 30 years from now or 40 years from now, 50 years from now, it's a lot less certain, right? The further away we get from something, the harder it is for us to plan. That's just common sense. That is not the way God operates. Before God created anything, before human beings fell, God knew the plan to redeem and restore the creation that doesn't even exist yet. God is certain about what will happen, and this creates tension between us because we are a people of expectation that crave certainty. And God is a God that is certain that certain things must happen. Second tension, perception versus reality. Verse 2, all the ways of a man or a woman are pure in their own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. What's more is when we make plans, we think they're good plans, right? And I don't mean like, oh, this is a good plan. We think like they're righteous plans. They're just plans. They're noble plans, right? We think our motives gen generally are pretty good. We justify ourselves. We do a lot of work to justify ourselves. But that's not the way the Bible says. The Bible says it's not always the case. You are a complex human being. You do not understand all the reasons why you do what you do. It's impossible. Particularly in every decision. You cannot think about every motivation that goes into every decision you make. You just don't have that kind of mental capacity. One, you don't remember like six years of the most formative years of your life being born and then early childhood. There are things that happen then that dictate some of the ways you act now, and you don't even remember it. What's more is you may not even be aware of it. That's okay. But in our perception, we are very aware of what we do, why we do what we do. 
But the truth of the matter is, you're not. You're like an iceberg, right? You're aware of what's going on on the surface, but there's a whole bunch more underneath. And again, that's okay. But we act with such, our perception, again, gives us such certainty in our plans. Whereas God, it says here in verse 2, God weighs the spirit. Which means God knows every single inch of the motivation. If you're like a, like a, a, a tiramisu, like a layered cake, right? God knows every single layer. And he still loves you, by the way. Our motivations are not always pure. Our motivations are not always righteous. And this is because our behavior is complicated. The third tension that we see in verse 3 is temporary versus eternal. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. I'm actually going to give us high marks here. I think many of us, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you genuinely want to give your plans to God. Oftentimes when you're facing a big decision or you're facing the day, and you're like, God, hey, I give you this day. I want you to make the most of it. We're really good about that. But we're not good at committing our plans to the Lord. And you might say, well, Travis, what's the difference between giving and committing? And I would say, oh, not much. Just the difference between a blind date and getting married to somebody. It's a vast gap. We give God our plans. And the moment that something seems to deviate from the vision that we had for our day or our plan or whatever it is, we're like, I'm going to take that right back, get it back on course, and I'm going to give it back to you, God. Just going just gonna to tweak it a little bit, you know? We're like God's editor, right? Like, come in and like, strike that. Yeah, I don't like that part. Okay, we're back on course. Let's go. But again, notice the tension there. That is not how God operates. God operates in the eternal. This makes our plans temporary. When we try to control every little thing, it makes our plans temporary. Whereas this word in, uh, in verse 3 in the second line, it says your plans will be established. That means they will have eternal significance. Like, for example, let me throw out an example. If you're an architect and you have plans to build a house, if you commit those plans to the Lord, what I don't mean is that that house will then stand forever, okay? That's not what that means. What I think it does mean is if you approach your work and your life and your career with it being committed to the Lord and your plans for your career committed to the Lord and your plans for designing that home committed to the Lord, what I think it means is God uses every single part of that planning process for his purposes and his glory and your good. So it might mean that that house that you're building, even, again, I know this, this might sound a little odd, but that house you build, you plan to build, might, just might, have somebody come to know Christ in it. That house you build might host a small group. That house that you build might have eternal significance. And you say, well, Travis, that's a little mystical. Okay, fine. What about this? What about as you're designing that house? You work with an interior designer. You work with other architects and planning it. And you're able to impact their lives because your goal isn't just to finish the house. Your goal is to have God glorified while you finish the house. It's different, right? It's a different thing. It's different to be committed to the Lord than it is to just give a plan to the Lord. And here's the difference. The three tensions that we're talking about, they show something about us, and it's this. It shows us that our purposes are often different our plans are often different than what God's purposes and plans are. That's the difference. Very often God will, will, we feel this tension and we feel it really, really deeply because what we want is we want him to rubber stamp our plans. We don't want him to give us anything to do. Now, it hasn't always been this way. Adam and Eve lived in a, in a position where they trusted God's guidance, and they were able to live in God's guidance without rebellion. But we don't do that because we're post-fall. We, we, one of the things you need to understand about yourself and about every single human being is that we simultaneously want God's guidance and resent God's guidance at the same time. And until you recognize that those two things are going on in you, you will never really trust God's guidance in your life. That you, won't, you don't recognize that there's something inside of you that pushes against God's guidance for your life. It's innate. It's part of the human condition. 
So you both want it and you both resent it. It's strange, but it's true. And this is why you can't trust yourself. This is why you can't just look inside yourself and be like, yeah, I can, I can figure this out. Now, I don't mean you should discount your voice altogether, but if the only person you trust to make decisions is you and your gut, you are not listening to the Lord. Jane Austen, author of many books, this one's from Mansfield Park, which I think was a movie maybe with Josh Hartnett maybe, you know right about that? Anyway, we have all a better guide in ourselves if we would attend to it than any other person can be. Jane, you're wrong. I think it's one of the reasons why Mark Twain said of her, every time I read Pride and Prejudice, I want to dig up Jane Austen and beat her over the head with her own shin bone. <laughs> it's a Twain quote. Look it up. Not making it up. I don't understand why he was reading Pride and Prejudice multiple times. But Twain kind of lived in his own, own world. If you're not taking Jane Austen and Mark Twain as authority figures, how about Jeremiah 17, 9? The heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart lies to you. You're not objective. You can't be. And that's okay. Stop, just stop pretending like you have this like, clear vision of what's supposed to happen because you can't. There's too much tension. There's too much mess involved. It is okay to have emotions and feelings. It's okay to feel like doing something. Here's the thing. If your life is like a car, your emotions and feelings should never be behind the wheel. They can ride shotgun. They can pick the tunes. They can even pick out nice places to eat. If you feel like Mexican, brother, go for it. I'm going to continue to beat that dead horse, by the way. But do not let them drive. You just can't trust them. So what I want us to do is I want us to take us a moment, and I want us to spend like 30 seconds in prayer, just confessing to the Lord that we really like to have control of our plans and that we're sorry for resenting his leadership in our lives. Let's pray. Amen. All right, so if we can't look inside ourselves, where should we look? And if you've been in church for three seconds, you know the answer here. We need to look to the Lord. We need to look to the Lord. Look at verse 9 of chapter 16. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Now, the Proverbs is repeating itself a little bit here, and that's okay. But there's a nuance in this one. It's talking about the way. Now, the way a person should go. Now, if you want to know what a person's way is, the best way I can describe it is everything, the macro decisions you make and the micro decisions you make underneath there. So you might say, hey, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get a four-year degree so that I can have a good career. That's a macro-level decision. But the micro-level decision along the same vein is I'm going to wake up today and not skip class so I can get a four-year degree and have a nice career. That's the micro decision on it. But all of that constitutes the way of a person, okay? So that's your way. And the way of a person is every decision, big and small, that makes up the course of their life. And again, God is the one who establishes this. Look what it says in verse 9. The Lord establishes his steps. Now, the English translation is not great here because in Hebrew, steps is not plural, it's singular. And what that implies is every single step you take, and I know all of us have the police stuck on our head, that's fine. Every step you take, you will have the Lord guiding, leading, and sort of superintending your steps. Now, I know there's some theological uh, sort of uh, stuff we can sort through there as to how much God is in control and his sovereignty. I got that. But on the whole, God knows what's going to happen, and God is there every step of the way. And this is echoed again in verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, 
but its every decision is from the Lord. Now, this is really fascinating because it's talking about the lot. The lot was this Old Testament means of discerning the will of God, and essentially, we don't really know what it is, but the best way I can describe it is it's like having a die, and you would ask it yes or no questions, and then you would roll the die, and that's how you would ask God, like, what should we do? Should we go up and attack the Amalekites? Yes. All right, let's go. Again, really cool that God sanctifies that. Um, I would not try it today. And the reason why is because in the new covenant, which is what we live under, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the spirit of God living inside of you. Now, I know many of you would love to have a magic die that told you what God wants for your life. But I promise you the spirit of God is way better, way better. But rather than getting into all of that, let's look at the fact that God took in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and he is providing ways to lead and guide his people. God desires you to follow him. God wants to lead you. God wants to guide you. God's guidance is not this thing uh, that you have to, to, it's not this secret thing, right? Most of us think God wants us to follow him in the same way that an older sibling wants their younger sibling to follow them after mom said you have to take your little brother or sister with you. That's how most of us are. We're like, oh, okay, fine. Like God's like, yeah, fine, whatever. Come on, sinner, let's go. Jeez. That's how most of us think. But God desires to guide our lives. He does. This is what he wants for us. If you look throughout Scripture, Genesis 12, he tells Abram, go to the land, what? That I will show you. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the rest of the book of Genesis are led and guided by God. He leads Israel in Exodus with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He guides David in preparing the materials for the temple. He guides Solomon in actually building the temple. He leads Israel through the prophets into and out of exile. God desires and shows again and again and again that he wants to lead us and guide us. But often we think that God is reluctant to do this. We feel like God is reluctant to give us the guidance that we want. And so what we do is we think it's this mysterious, magical thing that we have to figure out. And so we tr this lets us fall into sort of weird practices. Like we'll look for signs that seemingly are just kind of unrelated. We'll be like, Lord, had a really bad day at work. And if the mailbox flag on my neighbor's mailbox is up as I'm coming home, that is a sign from you that I need to quit my job. So prepare my wife for that conversation, because I'm done. Or we'll, we'll do kind of sort of weird things, like we'll talk about something that God's always wanted to do in our life, but we've never actually done it. I had this happen a lot in seminary. I'd have people be like, oh yeah, God's been calling me to be an army chaplain forever, and I just keep running from him, and I'm like, Maybe God's not calling you to that if, like, you aren't doing it. I don't know. Or one of my favorite ones, and we've all done this. You take your Bible, and you're like, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to open up God's Word to a random page, and I'm just going to point to a verse, God, and that's what you're going to want me to do. And he hacked them to pieces in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> Probably not God's will for your life. That's a real passage, by the way, 1 Samuel. Check it out. Sometimes we even syncretize our worship of God. We look at horoscopes, astrology, omens. And I go, oh, that's a bad sign. If you're a baseball fan, you get into superstitions. We agonize over the will of God. We sweat one decision over another that it won't be God's will. And we make the wrong decision. You are out of God's will. Like, don't drift. But I can tell you this. That is not God's will for your life. That is not how God wants you to follow him. God does not want to be hard to follow in that regard. God in his grace desires that we follow him. And he, he wants to make it very clear. God's will is like a canyon that you have to actively crawl out of. And I don't, I've never been in a canyon, honestly. But I imagine you don't just like jump out of it. It's a series of decisions. It's step after step. A lot of us view God's will as this invisible tightrope over like Niagara Falls. And if we fall off of it, we grope in the dark for 30 years trying to figure out where God's will went wrong. And then we get back on it for like five minutes and then we fall off of it again. That's what we think God's will is like. And it's not that way. 
You don't have to walk on eggshells thinking that you're just going to abandon God's plan. God's will for your life is that you follow his voice. And I think his voice is very clear. I just think we've forgotten how to discern that. So let's talk about that. How do we look to the Lord? How do we follow him? Well, first, what is God's will? A lot of us mess up that question. And the reason why we mess it up is because we add two words to the end of it. What is God's will for me? All right, I've got bad news for you. God's will for everyone is the exact same. You're not special. You are special. You're just not special in that way, okay? It's okay. I love you. God's will for every single human being is told to us in Romans 8, 28 and 29. All things work together for the good of those that love him and who have been called according to his purpose. And then we stop there. We're like, yep, everything's going to work out for me. What's his purpose? 29 tells us that we might be conformed to the image of his son. God's will for your life is that you become more like Jesus. That's what he wants for you. So everything that happens, everything that goes on in your life is there to make you more like Jesus. That is God's will for your life. Now, who, what did Jesus do? He lived sacrificially, he loved God, and he loved other people. And so everything kind of falls in that sort of category. Augustine famously said, love God and do whatever you please, which is a great quote. He's not wrong. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, this is God's will, your sanctification. What does sanctification mean? Becoming more like Jesus. Matthew 5.48, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Again, Jesus is perfect. Be complete, be whole like Jesus. And so what happens is once you have that question, you can then start to navigate every single decision in your life by that one question. By that one question, how is this going to make me more like Jesus? Which of these things is going to make me more like Christ? Now, obviously, there might be some subset questions under there to help you discern that. Like, what idols might present themselves in this situation that I need to avoid? How can others be helped or harmed by choosing one thing over another? How could this course of action further God's kingdom? Is this course of action simply a way for me to further my own plans and my own goals and put a stamp of it that says it's Jesus telling me to do it? Here's another good one. How will this course of action make me trust Christ more and have more faith? How is this going to challenge my faith? And this is how you make decisions. Looking at getting a new job, starting a new career, whatever, which one's going to make me more like Christ? Not which one's going to get me more money. Not which one's going to be better for my family. The first question you ask is, which one's going to make me more like Christ? Going to date a person? Thinking about getting married? Thinking about getting a divorce? Which choice is going to make me more like Christ? And if you're thinking about a divorce, I'd say probably about 95% of the time, staying in the marriage is going to make you more like Christ. Where should I go? What should I do? Should we buy a new house? Should we downsize? Which one's going to make me more like Christ? Not which one's going to get us into a better school system. Not which one's going to make more room for our stuff. Not which one's going to have, uh, give us status. Which one is going to make me more like Jesus? Now, are the other things to factor in? Sure, fine, go for it. But until you answer the first question, you can't answer the other one. So what I want us to do again is take that decision that you were thinking about when we started, that big decision for the week, and ask God, which choice, what is going to make me more like Christ? And let's pray. Let's pray. Amen. All right. One last practice to adopt is that we have to look to other people 
Look at verse 14 of chapter 11. So we're going to skip back a couple pages here. Where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. You need people to go alongside of you because when you ask the question, which one's going to make me more like Jesus, sometimes it's not real clear. Sometimes you're like, I don't know. Sometimes our motives, again, aren't clear. We can't trust ourselves, right? Some of you, when I started talking about the other things that you might factor into a decision, you were like, well, I should think about those things. That's that resentment of God's will in your life that keeps coming up, by the way. That's what that is. So we need guides. We need other people with us to lead us and guide us and talk, bounce ideas off of, all sorts of stuff like that. What's interesting, too, about the Proverbs is they never actually advocate for one counselor. They always advocate for a multitude of counselors, many counselors. This is how we combat that tendency to, to make our plans about ourselves. You need advice. You need counselors at every level. Spiritual counselors, professional counselors, people who are there to help you with your job, people that are there to, to counsel you through, through mental illness, right? Let me say this. Anytime you are planning on doing anything, anytime you're planning on having, making a major decision in your life, you should talk to at least three people that you trust. And here's the problem with that. Most of us don't have three people that we trust to spiritually guide us. And this is why you need to be involved in a group. Look, you don't need to be in a connect group maybe to hear another person teach. We have some great teachers around here, and you will be fed and nourished by them, absolutely. You probably don't need a connect group to have uh, a social calendar. You've probably got enough people to hang out with and be friends with. What you do need a connect group for is a group of people that when you are stuck and you don't know what to do, people that will know you well enough and know your walk with the Lord well enough to sit down beside you and say, let's figure out together, let's pray together, and figure out which one of these things is going to make you more like Jesus. That's what you need a group for. You should get one today. If you're wondering what decision you should make, the answer is, is, is very obvious. You should be in a group with other believers. Secondly, another great place to find wise counsel is among the dead. We're very arrogant as a generation. We tend to think that we've got it all figured out. But we also live in a really cool generation where you have access to tons of stuff written by people who are dead. So I would encourage you, read, listen to people who have come before you. When I first uh, started struggling with anxiety uh, in, in 2015, I've struggled with it all my life, but really became aware of it in 2015, I was really upset because I thought that I was a part of the generation that has anxiety and all, everybody kind of criticizes millennials and Gen Z folks for having anxiety, like, well, we never dealt with that in our generation. Okay, you did. It just wasn't okay to talk about it. Secondly, I know you did because there's a guy named Richard Baxter who was a Puritan uh, minister who wrote a book in the 1600s called Dealing with Anxiety and Depression. So I don't think it skipped a couple centuries and landed in our generation. Everybody's kind of dealt with it. And this was so reassuring to me. This person who, this pastor who dealt with this way back when was so encouraging and edifying to me. It's a really good book. Another, if you don't like to read, fine. There's a great podcast called Revived Thoughts. And I've listened to it before. I've talked about it before. They take old sermons by dead people and they preach them. They give you a little background about the person that, that wrote it and then they actually preach it. The best one I've listened to so far is from August 25th of this year by Charles Spurgeon. And it's do not despise the day of little things or the day of small things. It's fantastic. Changed my life. Another place that you can find a wise counselor is somebody who at one point was dead, but he's not anymore. Isaiah 9, 6 calls the Messiah the wonderful counselor. Jesus desires that we go to him. You see, Jesus, have you ever noticed Jesus never asks God the Father what to do? He never says, like, Lord, what should, I, what should I do? Where should I go? In fact, Jesus knew exactly what he had to do. The Gospels are full of must. I must do this. I must go there. I must do that. And the place where Jesus had to go, ultimately, was the cross. He had to go to the cross because we both resent God's will, resent his guidance, and we desire it. And Jesus wants to alleviate that tension in your life. He wants to alleviate that in you. He wants to make it very clear what you need, and it's that you need him. Because you cannot find the way 
to salvation apart from the grace of God, apart from this gift of Jesus Christ crucified. When the Lusitania was sunk in 1915, there was a woman named Nettie Moore who, ironically enough, washed up on the side of a beach in Ireland. And she was so unconscious, I know, I'm just contradicting myself. She was so unconscious that they put her with the dead. And her brother, who was also on the ship, started looking for her. And he noticed among the dead, he found this woman, his sister. He noticed she was breathing. But everybody else was so busy, they didn't notice it. But he noticed because he was looking for his sister and he loved her. Jesus Christ is looking for people amongst those who are adrift. And he's there with a boat and he says, come in. Let me rescue you. He notices you. He sees you. Will you get in the boat with him? Will you get out of the water? Will you let his cross be the vessel that takes you home? Maybe that's the decision you need to make today. You can't trust yourself. Doesn't mean you can't have an influence in it, but you just can't trust yourself. You need to look to the Lord and look to others. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, it is good to be found by our Savior, by our brother, the Son of God. And Lord Jesus, thank you for not giving up on me, not giving up on us. Thank you that you bled for a group of people that wouldn't even be alive for 2,000 more years, but you were certain. And you set your face and you did what you must do so that we could be guided by your spirit and be shaped more and more into your image. And Lord God, I don't know what else is better than that. Have your way in us, O oh Lord. Lead us. May we have the courage to follow and may you remind us how much we resist that. And may you heal us from it by your grace. Thank you for being patient with us. It's in your great name we pray, amen.